The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good evening, everybody. It's Tuesday, 29th of July. My name is Frank Pixel, and we are here for another V. Brownback. Um, this evening, again, with Phil Monk, who's a senior consultant for VMware PSO, and he will be talking about service design and gathering customer requirements and use cases for VCAC. Before we actually start, um, I'd like to share some information, especially since VMworld is coming up. Um, there will be the VBrownback Tech Talks again. Everyone can speak about everything as long as it's slightly technical and not a complete sales pitch. There will also be a party prior to the um, actual VM world uh, hosted by VM Underground, and they will have some tech talks as well um, called the Opening Act. The agenda and registration can be found uh, on their website. And also, if you're interested in virtualization, you definitely should have a look, if you hadn't had yet, at the Virtual Design Master Competition that is going on right now. Um, more info details and the recordings of all the judgments and designs can be found at www.virtualdesignmaster.com. If you have any questions during the uh, actual webcast, just either use the questions panel or drop a message via Twitter with the vbrownback hashtag, and uh, I will relay them to Phil Monk. And then we can actually start. Over to you, Phil. Uh, excellent. Um, do you want to hand me over as yeah. uh, presenter? Yeah. Cool, here we go. Share my screen. Excellent. So can everybody see my screen okay? Yep. Cool. Brilliant. So uh, the session today is around uh, designing a service in BCAC. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, common use cases that, that we see in uh, PSO. Uh, and I also wanted to talk um, about how to deal with the, uh, the classic thing that you get from a customer where they brought BCAC. Uh, they have a rough idea that, that it builds virtual machines. and they want to be able to, to use it and you have to help the customer shape their requirements and their business cases from something that is, is very rough and very, um, should we say, uh, undefined to something that, that is, is going to give them value and, and something that's going to meet issues they've got in their current environment. So uh, we'll do a little bit of about me. I didn't do one of these last week, um, but I'll do one this week. So um, I've been working with VMware uh, PSO for around uh, Actually, it's about 19 months now, or just over a year and a half. Um, I'm a senior consultant working in the uh, cloud automation practice, focusing mainly on BCAC and BCO. Uh, this also involves inherently vSphere and VCD as well. It, it, in previous life, I've, I've been at, uh, expertise in that. Um, I've been working with VMware products for about 10 years now. Um, been VCP since 2.5, um, all the way up to, to the current versions. Um, have a couple of VCAPs uh, and working towards my BCDX, hopefully to be taken uh, next year. If you want to find me, you can find me on Twitter uh, with my hashtag, um, with my at, sorry, uh, and you can also uh, find me on LinkedIn if you want to add me um, on there. Okay, so uh, so let's move into to what I, I want people to be able to, to get out of this session. So at the end of uh, what we talk about today, I'd like people to be able to to show the value of VCAC to their customers, be able to talk about uh, not just, just how it meets their initial requirements of automation of provisioning a virtual machine or, or automation of, of certain services in their AD or automation of, of something uh, unique to, to their uh, infrastructure, but also be able to, to say, so, well, if we do this, we can also do this. This is something else that we can, we can add value to, to uh, a service here, or we can add value to an integration here, etc. So understanding how BCAC can automate anything with an API. Uh, if you speak to any of our uh, sales team um, when they come in to, to sell you BCAC or sell you a license renewal and get you to upgrade to, to uh, the vCloud suite licenses, um, they'll definitely and, and rightly tell you that, that BCAC will be able to automate anything that we have an API for. 
uh, or you have an API for it in your infrastructure. So it will speak to anything that has APIs readily available. So uh, understand the limits of VCAC workflows. Uh, this isn't the, the anything as a service. These are the, the .NET workflows that run internally in VCAC. Um, it's understanding where we, we break out from the .NET workflows into VCO and where in some cases um, you're doing things inside VCAC in, in the um, .NET workflows using the design tool it is, is the right way to do things, uh, where VCO is the right way to do things. Uh, understanding the value of the machine lifecycle. I've been on some engagements recently um, where uh, customers have implemented um, uh, X as a service uh, or AD, ADS as provisioning and creating virtual machines and deleting them and performing uh, activities on them like adding memory and CPU as well rather than using the, the inbuilt VCAC machine lifecycle. Uh, the machine lifecycle offers a number of, uh, of values uh, and allows you to, to be able to track virtual machines rather than just to sort of have a virtual machine that has a load of day two activities constructed on it without any sort of context. So understanding the stubs in BCAC as well, um, the out of the box ones where you'll be able to customize stuff with a designer uh, when you don't have um, a CDK license and then also we'll talk about when you have a CDK license and how you can uh, integrate uh, and create your own um, stub workflows at any point of the machine lifecycle. Now we're not going to talk about these things explicitly, they'll be bundled into to things that we talk about in other topics. Okay, so then we'll move on to, uh, to designing our service. So as with any design process, you start with gathering the, the business case and, and the, uh, the requirements and constraints and the uh, assumptions. So uh, we'll focus mainly on requirements and business cases uh, rather than talking about assumptions and risks because uh, they're uh, constraints because they're you know unique for a business and we, we can't really generalize about them. So one of the first things we uh, we get when we go on a PSO engagement is we'll, 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 be, uh, we'll walk in and we need to understand what the, the use case the customer has for BCAC. Now as I discussed earlier that could be um, could be a number of things. It could be either um, provisioning a virtual machine on a self-service manner, which is a common requirement, or it could be automating provisioning activities uh, additionally or on top of the self-service virtual machine provisioning. So we could be talking about things like integration with CMDB systems. We could be talking about IPAM systems for provisioning IP addresses. Uh, there's a number of, uh, of elements that, that can come into that. So sitting down and talking with the customer and understanding their view and their vision of, of how they're going to, to use VCAC is important. You'll find very commonly that customers will have an incorrect understanding of, of how VCAC is going to be provisioned or used or, or what it can offer um, and you may have to shape the customer's expectations and thinking around or maybe even introduce them to, to new things it can do. So clearly defining requirements of a business case before designing the services, uh, that's, that's, that's very key. Um, you need to, to definitely make sure that the services that you're going to design for VCAC can offer. Um, with X as a service, like I said, we can offer nearly anything with an API, but if it's a manual process that they want to automate straight away, then they need to really document and, and present to you the, the, the manual process for you to analyze whether it is something you can, can orchestrate with VCAC. So um, understanding some of their requirements, things like um, a requirement for self-service provisioning, maybe machines be deployed with a no, non, no approval, machines just sort of get fired out, or machines can have different levels of approval. Um, that's just one example there. And then an automate uh, provisioning activity for a self-service machine could be added to the CMDB like we talked about. There. Um, like I was saying, customers often have unclear requirements because they don't understand the product. Um, and this is, is something there's a consultant that you, you really sort of need to focus on, um, making the customer understand what the technology can do. Um, to get customers to sign off business requirements and case studies as well um, is, is also very, very important. We, every engagement I worked on with BCAC, we, we go in, we get all this defined, they understand the product, we, we, we start to build it and then they see uh, they'll see something that they'll go oh, oh can we can we add this to our service can we can we maybe uh, add in a, a function to display 
um, but when a virtual machine is in use, could we maybe integrate with this as they realise the potential and the, the extensibility and the customizability of the products, your requirement and the requirements will will grow. Um, and if you have a, an engagement where cost is a factor and you've got a certain amount of time and a certain amount of money, you may not be able to allow that, that to happen. So getting them to sign up and agree that this is what they want is something very important. So let's move on to so uh, how I define business cases. So this is an example um, slide that I put up. There's another one after this as well, which is the continuation of, of what I'll sit down in front of a customer and what we'll talk and work through when we're trying to um, design and outline their service. So we, we first of all, we start off with, with who are the people going to be requesting it. So in this example here, we, we speak about developers are going to be requesting this service. Um, and the service, uh, as we can see outlined in the gold, is going to be provisioning a virtual machine to, to an available virtual data set. So this is based on a standard virtual machine blueprint provisioning service. So our description, uh, you can detail that the, the customer what the description of the service is and try and, and get the customer to articulate what they think the service is exactly. So deploying a virtual machine for testing uh, within an organization. And these include rapid provisioning for virtual machines using vSphere fast provisioning. So, so, so vSphere fast provisioning might not be something that some customers want. It might be beneficial to some others. So prerequisites and preconditions. So these are determining what needs to be in place for the, the user to be able to consume the service. So identify the types of virtual machines that are required for the catalog. So these can be uh, anything from Windows to Linux machines to uh, we had a requirement uh, a little while ago for an AIX machine that one of my customers uh, been provisioned through VCAC, so that was um, something we don't see every day, but, but it, it was something we could offer, um, so something you should outline, identify the access controls, it's very often uh, the catalog items that you're deploying, uh, you might not want people to have access to certain elements of the virtual machines from certain areas of organisations until they uh, go through a building process or, or an enabling process. Um, the decommissioning of virtual machines tied to blueprint as well, that decommissioning process is also important to remember. Identifying the approval process for, for adding virtual machines to the environment. Does there need to be an approval from financial? Does there need to be approval from um, uh, compliance before you provision something? There can be a number of things you need to consider around this. Determining dependencies of virtual machines. Um, so if you're provisioning a, a virtual machine, a uh, Windows one for example, are there tools that are deployed onto a, a Windows virtual machine which, it, which are external to, uh, to this provisioning process but, but need to be considered? Things like antivirus, um, maybe a, a corporate branding of some sort, group policy, adding to a domain. These are the, the things that you need to sort of run through with the customer and really drill out with them what, what, what needs to be on that virtual machine. Identify the life cycle requirements. So this refers to when we provision a virtual machine, are we going to uh, to track it through the machine life cycle for things like uh, archiving and lease times? So are we going to say that these developers in this use case provisioning these virtual machines can only have them running for uh, two weeks before they're, they're, they're expired and put into uh, an area where they uh, are archived? Or are we going to allow them to keep them indefinitely? Uh, this may be something that is dependent on the customer's billing technique. So if a customer is, uh, is going to be billing a, for a virtual machine that, that is based on usage, then you ideally want the virtual machines to be um, available for a certain number of time, but not indefinitely, because you'll find that users will provision virtual machines, use them for a couple of weeks maybe, or a couple of months, and then they might sit there doing nothing, in which case when the virtual machine sat there doing nothing, it's is taking up resource, but it's not delivering you a, a cost in your charging model. But beware, if you have a, a virtual machine lease period that's uh, of two weeks, a virtual machine is used constantly for two weeks, and then as it sort of drips off its usage, it, it's archived off, and the, uh, the customer has an option to restore it or completely remove it, and you, it could be more profitable. It can also come down to capacity for that as well. So if you've got an environment that um, it's limited on resource or you, you don't have a very good way of being able to project your um, your capacity planning um, and maybe you, you don't want virtual machines to be sitting on equipment for a long time um, and you want them to be removed off. 
So something like VCOPS uh, will or VCOPS, sorry, will be able to tell you um, whether your uh, capacity planning is, is is looking good or not. And it can predict into the future based on trends, etc. So that's something that, that might be an additional tool that you could maybe speak to the customer about. So all of these uh, these things as you talk to customers and try and design the dependencies and the prerequisites and preconditions, more and more will come out. Um, so you'll find that. So one of my customers, we spent a day just going through this, talking about their current build process and what they currently do for their uh, virtual machines when they're built. So, so they have to have, uh, for one of my customers, they had to have um, the machine kit accounts pre-created in the OU. They had to have uh, a user account unique for that VM also created in the, the Active Directory before. Uh, and then we, we had the, the challenge of being able to give the the user requesting the virtual machine that account information. Uh, we had to also pre-populate the machine in active uh, in antivirus. Uh, we had to prepare some uh, packages for it in Puppet uh, to be deployed on it to, to apply additional configuration. So there's all these things that, that you need to sort of really draw out and then and get your whiteboard pens out and start drawing on the whiteboard uh, what leads into some other things. Um, it's it's very important because you don't want to draw up your design and, and then miss something that you need to integrate with or something that is a, a precondition or a prerequisite of, of your service being delivered. So the next thing I talk about is, is the typical course that the user is going to take for provisioning this resource in a new environment. So this is a mixture of you using your knowledge of VCAC uh, and the products and integration points that you've discussed above and trying to map out how the user would go about requesting something in VCAC. So, so this this section is also very long sometimes. So we, we talk here that a developer navigates to the portal page and we have such as and an example um, URL. The developer enters domain credentials. So in some customers they don't want domain credentials to be used. They'll have a, a specific um, user account or, or directory that they will uh, create for, for a customer when they're onboarding them, if it's a, a cloud, public cloud provider, if it's an internal cloud, then, then very often they, they might use uh, their internal domain accounts. Uh, and then developer deploys a virtual machine from Blueprint into, into an appropriate endpoint. So, so that's very open. An appropriate endpoint could be um, a mixture. Uh, this customer here was only using vSphere, um, but I'm, I'm focusing most of my examples on during this. But uh, some customers we have use um, vSphere, VCD is still heavily used, um, even though it's not something that we, we push very much at VMware at the moment. Um, we also have a lot of people taking up VCAC with, with our uh, VCHS endpoints uh, for our hybrid cloud service. And uh, we also have a lot of customers using AWS, um, which uh, I'm sure as you know is uh, Amazon's cloud service. So then, uh, you know, once the user's provisions, the, the information, what, what do we expect them to see? That's, that's the next session. So what's the expected results? So a uh, developer has access to the deployed virtual machine within a short period of time frame, and the developer is easily able to utilize the deployed workload. So uh, it's really worth drilling out at this point. Once the customer's got their virtual machine, the tenant's got their virtual machine, how do they expect to be able to, to access it? Um, is it SSH? Uh, from a, a local desktop, is it SSH from the internet, is it SSH from a VPN, is it SSH from a dedicated network, same with RDP, is it from a dedicated network, VPN, uh, from a desktop, from the internet, um, or are they just expected to use VM uh, remote console? Uh, you really need to, to gauge what the requirements are for the user to be able to access the workloads. And sometimes you'll say that to a customer and I go, oh, we're not bothered by, by any of them, it can be RDP from from our corporate network and from uh, from VPN as well, and then when you say to them, okay, but but um, you need to do things like like mount media, or you need to to look at an ISO uh, uh, the post screen on a boot. How how are you going to do that over uh, RDP? Is that a requirement? Are they ever going to need to be able to do that? And that will dictate some of your uh, your access methods for for people utilising the workloads. We also uh, also like to, to talk about an alternative course. So, and if a user was going to access uh, the portal and uh, something was broken, for example, or something was down, how would be another way of accessing it? So uh, here we've got developer navigates to a portal page, such as 
we've actually got a, a vCloud information uh, here. So this, this could actually be the, we would want to put here uh, for this customer, if they're already using vSphere, we would want to put the, uh, the SSO page, for example, and it could navigate to, to the SSO page rather than the VCAC appliance. Um, enter domain credentials and request a VM uh, to be presented with a requested VM already deployed and then has access to all of their virtual machines by an alternative method. So this is more about planning um, access for possibly if the user is going to have uh, different ways of accessing a workload. So if they're going to be work, uh, accessed from example the corporate network and from a VPN network if they're at home. The VPN network might have a different way of accessing the VCAC portal than than if they're in, inside on the corporate network. Same if, if you've got um, a cloud that's presented to the internet and internally you may access it over the internet in a different way than what you do internally. Maybe a different user account or it may be a different URL, etc. Then uh, I have a general comments page uh, section, sorry, on, on how the, the customers going to, some comments that the people want to make maybe on customers going to to deploy workloads, what the intention is, etc. It's more the, it's just a, a no section in my, my information list. And then uh, performance is very important. So I go to customers all the time and we sit down and say, so, okay, so we, uh, we've got your uh, general requirements, but we haven't got any sort of cloud SLAs or, or anything around how long you're agreeing with your customers is going to be an acceptable time for you to provision a virtual machine. Or, how long it's going to be to power on a virtual machine, or shut down a virtual machine, or restart a virtual machine, or how long it's going to take to mount media, etc. Now these are things that you need to be able to uh, really sort of plan for the things like uh, utilization on your on your Visa environment underneath. So if they have a very a very long SLA for uh, provisioning times, then you you don't need to use fast cloning. You don't need to use, um, you know, maybe you can turn off things like VAI or, or that. there's no requirement for storage DRS for initial placement of, of workloads based on I/O, etc. So, uh, so it's really important to, to tell the customer they need to define cloud SLAs with their their end users as well as as well as themselves internally for you to be able to, to decide how you deliver this service and how much you. How much you over provision? How much you uh, you can contention ratios on your CPUs? Your sizing? It's all going to be dictated by by these sort of performance SLA statistics that you define. So reliability is good as well. Um, a lot of, a lot of customers uh, don't really think about uh, maintenance windows. So they'll say, oh, at the, at the moment in our current environment for this customer, we 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 have the whole of uh, Tuesday uh, after six to nine o'clock on a Wednesday morning to do what we want really, we have a maintenance window, as long as we tell them we're taking something down, it's fine. Then you, you turn around and say to them, okay, but, but is the, so is the customer going to be accessing anything over that time? Well, no, because we, we don't allow them access. I mean, if you're, you've got self-service provisioning portal where they can go in any time and provision what they want and do what they want at any time of the day, then very often the maintenance windows you have and the SLAs you have with uh, a current setup or, or physical infrastructure doesn't really cut it. So the, very often you, you need to preempt the customer to talk to their end users about these sort of information or if there are no end users you need to prompt them to define something that is competitive in the marketplace but they're going to be providing this service. So fault tolerance uh, is often something that um, gets confused with the actual fault tolerance products but um, this is more protection. So, so what what are you going to offer on your SLA, on your on your uh, vSphere endpoints, or maybe even your VCD endpoints to be able to to service your SLAs above? So you know, nine times out of ten, uh, H VMware HA is more effective. But if if you're going to allow customers to provision applications in the cloud that are going to be uh, highly available, and these are going to be applications that you're going to offer in blueprints, then and maybe that blueprint needs to be um, needs to be uh, clustered, needs to have some sort of application. Um, awareness in it for uh, for high for high availability. And this service you're provisioning here, what is the priority of it? Is it a service that it is classified as high? Is it something that's going to the customer's going to generate a lot of revenue from? Is it something that the the customers thinks that it's only going to be used maybe once a week or something like that? So you can clarify how important it is when you've got um, a load of services that you're designing, which ones you prioritise. Um, a project I'm on at the moment has nearly 50 services that we're provisioning, not just virtual machines, but also other things. 
uh, we've had to prioritise which ones are the most important um, and which ones aren't based on how much revenue the customer is going to generate from each service. Okay, so, so business rules, um, these are the rules that the business will put in place uh, for you provisioning this service. The developer needs to quickly provision virtual machines. Uh, the developer is able to quickly test new features. So in this example here, um, the developers were needing to, to build something very quickly to test a couple of lines of code and then trash it. And, and very often these, these virtual machines were only been up for an hour or two. And we have a, a level for assumptions, issues and risks that you may see with this service. So um, assumptions, you would really want to drill out. Um, my experience is that uh, assumptions make an idiot out of you and make an idiot out of the customer as well. So try not to have as many assumptions. Try to definitely drill something down. Um, so a common assumption is, uh, is that the users will, will know what their provisioning is going to be is going to be sufficient to their needs. Uh, that's not always a, an assumption you should make. But assumption uh, that a lot of my customers um, say to me as well is that uh, they're assuming that when people consume this service, they, they they're going to know how to use VCHC. Um, you should never never really uh, assume that. Even the basic catalog options for provisioning collection machine blueprints and services. If if you're an end user, a librarian, or or um, someone that works at a cashier or something, you have to think that are they really going to know how to use the system if you just throw them the URL? Um, so some sort of user education, and, and maybe that might dictate fit warning messages and support information that you you pre-populate the portal. Risks may be things like um, the service might not might not be delivered in time. Um, you know, technology risks as well you can look at, for example. Um, and issues are things that maybe during this this drilling through this um, business case building, you, you know, you haven't got answers for things that you need to get answers for from the customer's complete service. So this business case is like, like I identified above and said previously is a machine blueprint. So we move on next to designing the machine life cycle. Um, this is something that, uh, but not all all the consultants will, will go through with their customers, but, but I find it, it's very beneficial. To, to sit down, run through the machine life cycle and, and actually ask them where they're going to want certain things to happen. So uh, we'll start with the master workflow on the side and if we, we look at the, uh, the actions that I've got pinned to, to each machine life state, we, we have a free request. Now this is a process that uh, isn't controlled by ECAC but it's something very often that the customer is going to have to, to facilitate to control access to the portal give our user access to, to be able to log in, etc. So um, at the requested stage, we have, a, we have the action identified as the user requests a blueprint and chooses a number of virtual CPUs and memory and gigabytes. So uh, VCAC is going to provide slider bars to select resource, limits are 1 to 8 virtual CPUs and 2 to 16 gigs of RAM for this customer. Uh, more resource than this limit requires additional approval. So we configured the blueprints for this customer. We've, we've a range for them to be able to customize them to this, this information. This was a requirement that we identified, well, we didn't either identify actually until this point. So we said to, to our customer, okay, well, you've got this nice shiny portal here, user comes in, going to request a virtual machine, how do they size it? And the, and the customer went, oh, well, we just assumed that they could request what they wanted. And we went, yeah, you can do that. Or you can do T-shirt sizes, they both have their the pros and cons. You can have small, medium, large, etc., and we can pre-size them. And that has its, uh, its, its use cases for being able to maybe size new modes correctly. Um, if you have t-shirt sizes, you can, you can try and, and, and model them so that if a certain number of a certain size is deployed, they will fit into your new modes. Um, but this customer wasn't interested in that. They just wanted to offer flexibility for the user to be able to provision what they wanted. So uh, we're awaiting approval. How, what are we going to do when, when a, a request needs approval? Um, so here we said emails will be sent to, to an approval for VM provisioning. If the request VM is larger than the limits above, the approval is also sent to the capacity planning team. So we had uh, triggers for additional approval here. Um, this was something that, that the customer wanted, but if, if uh, someone actually wanted something to do, for example, they had a, a stupid request um, 
as one of their first virtual machines was, well, we need a virtual machine with 16 virtual CPUs and 32 gig of RAM. And that triggered uh, for them to go for an additional approval. Um, and the capacity planning team turned that down because it, it didn't fit um, their current model that, that they wanted to, to be able to, to onboard customers. And when we actually sat down and, and asked this customer why they wanted that large virtual machine, um, the answer was the classic uh, because the virtual, uh, the physical one we have has got that resource. Um, not great, but sometimes you meet those sort of things. So, uh, how are we going to do those emails? VTS will send an email via SMTP. Um, again, that was we, we stated that there because the customer was under the illusion that BCO would be doing this, and we were trying to tell them, but no, this is a BCAC task. So looking at the, the master workflow again, once that's approved, we, we move on to a building virtual machine state. Now this is a um, workflow that's dependent on what action you select for your, your blueprint. So the most common one is, is clone, so a clone from a template. So that's the one we've used here. But you can also have the build, which builds a brand new fresh virtual machine, but, but doesn't necessarily install anything. So uh, our clone workflow here, um, we've called out when certain things are done to let the customer know. So the customer had concerns around when the CPU and memory was sized. Um, they had things built into their template that, uh, that would, would depend on the virtual machine, the CPU and memory being uh, the size it needed to be during SysPrep, not, not as a post activity to SysPrep being done. So we, we, we identified to them that the virtual machine CPU and RAM is customized when the, when the image is deployed um, after it's cloned. So we also identified them when the uh, customized OS steps were done. SysPrep, uh, this was something that they wanted to know. So once that clone workflow is finished, we, we move on to a machine provision state. Uh, and we then have uh, a stub workflow here, which is a standard or stub workflow that we were calling out to BCI. Now we were calling out to BCI to, to perform a number of activities. Uh, for this customer here, we were installing antivirus. We were populating the, uh, the virtual machine in Blade Logic. We were installing two different types of BMC agents, and we were also integrating with Net Backup. Uh, now, VCO workflows will be configured to email us some TP destination. We wanted to integrate with some of these products over an API, but unfortunately, the customer's budget didn't allow us to be able to do this uh, and sit down and go over with them for this exact example here. So we, we sent a, an email form to their ops team. Uh, and their ops team would go off and uh, install these agents manually. Um, Net backup is a bit of a touchy one actually because um, we have that at a lot of customers. A lot of customers use Net backup, but unfortunately, there's no direct API that we can integrate with at the moment. So uh, there's a uh, manual fulfillment on, on most of the, our Net backup requests. Um, Blade Logic, we have a plugin for Blade Logic uh, for VCAC and VCO. Uh, the VCO one, I don't know if it's um, publicly available, um, but it, the uh, one for VCAC, I believe, is. Um, and our, our antivirus software in this customer was McAfee, so we we could have integrated with that if we wanted to, because there was an API. So this uh, stub workflow here collected all this information about the virtual machine, its name, its IP address, the user that provisioned it, put it all in a nice email form and, and filed it off to uh, an ops team. Um, we got an email and then the email was automatically logged into their call system um, and then it was picked up that way. So after that's uh, happened, the machine is activated um, so, and the machine is then turned on um, and the machine sits in a running state until, uh, until something else is done with it. So sitting through and actually working with the customer designing what's going to happen in the machine life cycle is, is, is quite important because it won't be to this stage but they'll realize that when, when they want to integrate with certain um, external services at, at, at certain times of the uh, provisioning process. So some customers during approval process uh, will want to do things while a machine is waiting to be approved. We want to do things like register with, with an IPAM system um, to get an IP address. And some customers will want to do that at the building machine state. They'll request an IP address from an IPAM system um, some customers will want to do things like, um, well, while we're waiting for approval, they'll do things like do capacity planning checks uh, to make sure that the virtual machine can be can be serviced to, to meet their cloud SLAs. Uh, at the machine provision stage, some customers will want to do things like uh, integrate with, uh, like I was saying before, CMDBs, 
uh, to add the virtual machines configuration to a CDB system. Uh, when the machine's activated, some customers then want to, to have a, a billing activity that is informed to the user. So although very often these products use a, a ICBM or a vCenter chargeback system, they, they also, a lot of customers have a, a billing system or a, a trigger or something that they don't want, to, want the customer or an internal system to be informed of a cost. Uh, that can happen at that point there. Uh, turning on, it, there's, there's sometimes activities that are done at this point. So um, in a previous version of ECAC, in a 5.2 version, a common thing I was doing at turning on stages was uh, running a, a BCAC.NET workflow to populate the description field with the IP address of the virtual machine. Something very simple, but the product didn't do this um, out of the box, so it was something that we, we scripted and, and wrote for it to be able to do it at that point. Um, it's, there's loads of use cases and loads of points that can be done for, for parts like this as well. So, just, uh, another example which just popped into my head is, is at the machine activate stage, we also had uh, a lot of our customers, we have to add attributes to the virtual machines in vSphere, so that when there's, uh, in VCAC 6 there's, there's very little, uh, well actually there's no reporting with VCAC alone, you have to use uh, ITBM to generate reports for you, um, and the reports that are generated are based on the, the ITBM licensing level you go for, but the uh, on 5.2, we, uh, you could uh, run reports based on attributes tied to virtual machines, um, and adding attributes to virtual machines also allows you to run things like chargeback reports um, for certain types of virtual machines, maybe ones that, that provision from a, a certain type of blueprint, etc. So there's many use cases that can be done at this point of the life cycle. And this also gives sight to the customer um, the benefits of using the life cycle over just building a virtual machine from a an X as a service option. You don't get all of these type workflows and you don't get all of this tracking of, of the machine through its different provisioning states. Okay, so we'll move on now unless there's any, any questions um, around the, the machine lifecycle service. No, there are no questions yet, so I think you can go ahead. Cool, excellent. Um, so we'll move on now to, to designing a, an, an X as a service. Um, so this is designing anything. Um, for this example here, we're going to use uh, load balancers being deployed um, for, for users' workloads that they provisioned using the previous machine lifecycle steps. So the uh, a load balancing service is something that, excuse me, nearly all of my uh, customers I've been to have either implemented or, or asked for it to be uh, uh, explained to them to be able to do it in the future, and they. They plan either to use a third-party product or one of our, our products in the system. So this one, I'm going to mainly focus on the context of using NSX. Um, so my, uh, my re most recent project uh, has been using NSX to deploy load balancers in VCAC. If any of you um, are active on the VMware Communities Forum uh, and look at the VCO forum quite a lot, you'll see that uh, Christoph has been um, posting lots of information about using dynamic types to be able to um, integrate directly with NSX to be able to do things like provisioning, uh, not, well, I don't think he's focused on load balances specifically, but he's, he's focused on a lot of the policy driven firewall um, creations and, and security groups and rules, etc. being able to create it from BCAC into NSX, uh, which is great stuff. So this is a very similar form, but it's, it's the same form to what we're using for the last surface. So we, we again look at the requesters, so it's going to be developers. So um, the same as what we had before, and that the category of this workload is XAAS uh, ASD. Now uh, ASD is the, the tool in VCAC that we use, the Advanced Service Designer, um, which provides us with the anything as the service um, usage. So the goal here is that users should be able to revision load balances in the cloud. Um, description that is, of our services, users should have the option to load balance virtual machines in their cloud. Two or more virtual machines can be load balanced. Options for load balancing policies must be provisioned, must be presented, as well as options for load balancing courts. Very common stuff if you're building a load balancer. If anyone's provisioned a uh, load balancer through NSX or provisioned a load balancer through BCNS, uh, you'll, you'll know these uh, these terms are very very common. So pre-access and preconditions. So we want to identify our virtual machines we're going to load balance. So identify our applications to be load balanced. Identify the networks for the internal external interfaces for load balancer. 
and identify certificate requirements. So very often, this is obviously unique for this for this service. But if you're uh, if you're talking about designing, for example, common ones we we do out of the box for nearly all customers, uh, whether they they sort of utilise them or not, are Active Directory ones. They they come more or less straight out of BCAC for doing things like uh, adding Active Directory users and removing users. It's the same uh, prerequisites that you, that you need to think about. So it does. This, is this a service that the user should just be able to provision? Do they need some sort of um, pre-authorization for provisioning this service? Is this a service that's going to be available to all users? Is this a service that is going to be available in a production or in a dev cloud? Is it going to be uh, something they can self-service? Is it going to be an admin service that you just, you just provision? Um, all of these things that sort of need to be drilled out at this stage. So some customers that I've been to will will allow users to provision their own load balancers. Some customers will, will limit the load balancers to, to being a, an admin feature that they will provision themselves. And there's various reasons around whether it's resource, whether it's costing, whether it's um, user user knowledge. They don't want to allow users to do it at start because they don't really know how to configure load balancers. They don't know what some of the terms are, etc. It's, it's a similar principle for, for any service that you're going to allow um, provisioning it in BCAC. You, you need to think about loads and loads of different different options around it. So a typical course for this is going to be very similar to what we had before. Navigate to the portal, um, enters domain credentials, so this may be like I was saying earlier, domain credentials, it could be unique um, user credentials for VCAC. If it's internet it could be something completely different. Um, developer deploys a load balancer from the advanced services section of the vCloud Automation Center portal. Uh, or it could be deployed in the catalog, it doesn't really matter uh, where you decide to provision it. Um, and developers select virtual machine, network port, service, and load balancing method during the provisioning process. And then what, what's an expected result? So this is the, the again, this is uh, defined here for, for the load balancer, but this should be the same for every service. Is the service going to add an item into the, uh, your item section of your of your um, VCAC portal for you to perform day two activities. So for example, on a load balancer, you may have that day two activity may be add a virtual machine or remove a virtual machine from a load balancer or even destroy the load balancer itself. So uh, if you're going to add an object in there, then that's driven by activities you're going to add afterwards. If it's something that, um, that you don't want to add an item into your UAFD, or your, uh, into your item section for, it may be something along the lines of sending an email to someone or requesting something um, in, a, in an email form. You don't want a, an email item to be populated. So something along the lines of that. So uh, our alternative course here, again, this is a, another method that if this was, for example, presented in a corporate network, if it's presented in a, um, over at the internet, you may access it differently than you would do um, via if it's on, your, on a VPN or, or something along the lines of those. So you've got to think about different ways of accessing it, if there are any. There may not be any different ways. It may be the same way of accessing it over a VPN as it is accessing it in the office, or it may be the same way of accessing it over the internet as there is as accessing it on the corporate network. Um, the only difference may be a URL. If, if the difference is the URL, then you should document that here. But if there is no difference, then you don't need this section. So again, we have the same comments as, uh, as previous, talking about um, cloud SLAs. Um, this should be more around um, how long it's going to take to provision the service, uh, if the service has an approval process in it, how long that approval process must take if it's a, a approval from the, the cloud provider. Um, there's, there's loads of uh, SLAs that you need to consider around performance uh, and reliability like we've outlined here as well. So reliability is if they provision a load balancer, uh, if the, is that load balancer going to be um, set up in a HA mode with, with two nodes? And one fail, one taken over, if one fails, or is it just going to be a single node, etc., etc. Um, same with fault tolerance. Is it going to be, uh, is it going to be provided that sort of resilience? Uh, priority again, same as what we had last time. If it's low, high, is it going to be? Do you see a lot of revenue being generated from it? That that can drive the priority. Um, do you see a lot of demand for it? Again, that can drive the priority. Uh, and business rules. So developers need to provision these on demand, so they need to be able to quickly test new features. Is that, that, that could be an example of, of a rule set out by the business. And again, we, we look at risks, assumptions, and issues, and we outline there 
what assumptions are made with this service? Do we know that what we present in the portal, low bounce as a service, do we know that users are going to, we're going to assume users know that that's an original low bouncer? Um, there is a risk that by not allowing approvals and not doing any sort of capacity planning that the users could provision so many load balances that brings down your environment uh, and, and issues with defining uh, the, some of the service steps in here that the customers may outline that you want, want to get back to them or you want them to get back to you on, on stuff. So we have a very different way of, of designing this uh, than we do with a machine life cycle because we, we don't have anything predefined to populate whereas we do with a, a machine life cycle blueprint service. We, machine life cycle blueprint service is in the, is in the product, it does it out of the box, there's pre-populated stuff we can configure and then we can add extensibility onto it. Designing an X as a service is there's nothing there, you, you have to decide what to do. Um, so here we do a, a very high level conceptual design and we map out the steps and some of the integration points for the customer to, to help us identify what what is going to talk to what, and what the, the steps are going to be from a very high conceptual level. So we've got here the tenant, they're going to access the VCAC self-service portal, we're going to request low balance in the virtual machines, um, the access service is going to invoke the VCA workflow to then low balance the virtual machines, the workflow that's going to run is, is going to query our IPAM system to get a virtual IP from a pool based on the network it's configured to, the load balancer is then deployed, the virtual machines are added to the load balancing pool, the configuration is complete, we update the CMDB system as an integration point there and we email the requester that the virtual machines have been load balanced. Very simple, very see-through. Um, it's, it's not designed at the conceptual stage to be complicated, it's designed to make the customer think about the steps that, that would be performed when provisioning this service. And when you understand the steps from a, from a manual prospect and then you start to translate them into a virtual prospect, this is the first thing you should do. Um, get agreement from the customer that this looks very conceptual, but like what they deliver at the moment, and then you can move on to a more advanced design. Uh, don't be, some some people that I've worked with uh, on projects have, have been worried about giving the customer something as simplified as this uh, when, when we're being paid with PSO. You, you should never be worried about doing things simple for a customer. That, that's, when you're doing something as, as complicated as designing anything as a service, you need to be start from the ground up and work to something complicated. So then I move on to something very different. Uh, we move on to, to maybe drilling down to the service uh, from a flow with a little bit more detail. We include things like error handling uh, and what have, what's going to be happening at, at different steps. So this one's a bit more detailed. So we request a load balancer service, select a load balancer. This is actually, I still have the remove section there. So this is requesting a load balancer service. We then pull an address from IPAM. If that's successful, we then execute the create load balancer service workflow in VCA. If that fails, we then log a support ticket, and we write some audit information, and we email our, our user that, that it's failed. But if it's successful, we go off and we create the load balancer. If that's successful, we then write some audit information to our logs to say we've done that successfully. Um, if that's successful, we then uh, update our CMDB. Uh, if that fails, we log a support call, we track the failure side things here. And then if, if, but if it's successful, we then email the user and tell them of the, of the success. So this is the above diagram, just drawn out in a, a, in a step by step, um, more granular level information. It's not massively granular, but, but it can provide a little bit more information. And we then move on to a physical design. Now this is, this is where you, you get a lot more complicated and you, you talk about um, designing your forms, your inputs for your workflows, your outputs, etc., etc. So this is where you, you really contain the information. One, one thing, however, I do want to outline is we never include any code in any of the service designs that I've done. The reason for this is that code changes very dramatically um, and you don't want to, to, to document explicitly what code you're putting in a workflow. If you're using a, an existing library workflow to do something, something simple like uh, get, get a virtual machine's name, um, uh, and convert that into a VC virtual machine object from a string, that workflow is, is in VCA, so in VCO, sorry. It's not something that you're going to have to, to write, so it's not something that you're really going to want to include code for in your design document. What you really need to state is we're using this, this workflow out of the box. 
um, and this is what it's going to do. But for this information here, so the first thing, my design documents obviously include a little bit more information. These are some snippets of some of the most important sections. So designing your ADS form. For those of you that haven't used um, the advanced service designs, advanced service designer, I've got the DNS around one way around there. It, it allows you to, um, to, it gives you a load of form types that you can you can choose to drop to include in your form. So you have everything from a string to a radio button. It allows you to do things like um, include drop down menus based on either a, a, a dictionary that you contain somewhere or a, an array which is contained in VCO. Or it'll allow you to, if you really want to get really complicated, you, you could have an action in there to go and pull something and then populate a drop down in VCO workflow and then populate the drop down in here. So this is about building your presentation layer for your customer, what you want them to see and, and how you're going to tie these fields you select in the, the advanced service designer to inputs in VCO. So when you select a, a drop down box in the advanced service designer, it will ask you you know, what input in your VCO workflow you selected in the previous step do you want to tie this, this into it? And you, you just click on, on what you want it. <clears throat> so I include uh, our design for the form. Um, I also find it very useful for that because it's, uh, it narrows down what the customer is expecting to see. So if a customer is expecting um, everything to be pre-populated with drop-down menus and, and that's not possible because of your because of, of what the workflow is, for example, uh, if, if you want a, a user to be able to go and um, rename a virtual machine, and they think that they're going to, and they want a drop-down menu with a load of pre-populated names to rename the machine to, then, then that's not, not, not inherently something that you would imagine. It might be that um, your assumption, you know what's said about assumptions, is that they're just typing the string of the virtual machine they want to rename. Um, so, so designing out the form and what the fields look like and what they're going to be and what sort of inputs is is very useful for customers and, and is very useful for yourself. So I also uh, go off and, and we talk about our uh, integration points, so existing systems the service will integrate with. Uh, if these are reoccurring workflows uh, to be used in all of your uh, Exeter services, uh, then you, you, can, you can document them in a, another document or you can specify that you'll be reusing workflows from, from another another service. So examples I've got here is that um, CMDB system and our, and our email emailing off the forms from, from BCO. These are going to be workflows that are going to be exactly the same in every service that I design for this customer because the CMDB is the same system and the email system is the same. Um, these are will be nested workflows in, in the master workflow to provision the, the load balancer here. We also uh, state that the API that they use, um, this is important because you need to understand what you're integrating with. Um, obviously REST, SOAP, HTTP, all that sort of stuff is, uh, is, all, is all standards for, for VCOs to be able to, to accommodate. But there may be, may be some, uh, some APIs that, that aren't out of the box and, and you need to go and download a plugin for or you, you may need to request the MIPSO to create your plugin. Or you could use dynamic types to create a plugin yourself. Um, that, that's something that, that will be supported in the next release of VCO. Uh, VCO. Um, also at this point when you identify your, your integration points for your other systems, requesting documentation on, on what the, uh, the APIs that you're integrating to look like. If it's an internal system, you'll very often find that customers will come back and say, uh, um, um, we, we haven't got any documentation, something we wrote um, if you sit next to Bob, he'll tell you about what you need to type and send to it. I, I absolutely hate that. And we tend to get a lot of intern, internal bidding systems where there will be an in-house system that someone's written that never documented. And there'll be a number of reasons for that, and some of them are very very justifiable. But it's it's very difficult for you to be able to work with something that's not documented on, on how it's going to react and, and what you need to send to it. If it's a system that's... Uh, has an API that's documented, then that makes things a lot easier, and you're not dependent on the customer to, to provide you that information. So the uh, the next one we've got here, the the, the big screen dump is um, of our uh, inputs and well, actually of our attributes. Um, so these are uh, things that your inputs and your outputs and your attributes are going to be things that you'll need to define as well. So your inputs will tie to your form, um, and you can specify, uh, as you can see in the form screenshot what field specifies to what input. 
Uh, your attributes will either be things that are pre-populated in the workflow, but you don't want to code into the code itself because they may change in the future, or they may be things that are pre-populated by other workflows. So for example, if you, if you decide to write a workflow for removing an NSX load balancer, that will actually be an action on your item inside the items tab of your advanced service in VCAC. And when you run that remove, the uh, virtual load balancer name or its unique identifier will be pre-populated um, as an attribute. So here we've got uh, some, some pretty generic ones that are better defined. Um, here we've got uh, the IP from our IPAM system is stored here as an attribute uh, because that's pulled from another workflow that will then provide that information for this one. It's also important to, to document your output put parameters. If you're using something like REST um, or SOAP that, that gives you a success or fail, um, or, or it gives you a very vague error message and your error handling is, is very easy, but if you're using something with a, with a plugin or something with dynamic types that will return you some sort of information that you can interpret, then um, that's important as well. You need to document that for, for being able to, to, be, to know what that's going to pass to in another workflow. So the example I used earlier was that the remove could be an action of uh, a day two action on our on our uh, created NSX load balancing. Uh, if that errors when we try to remove it, are we going to how do we want to handle that? Are we going to remove the item and assume it's worked from the portal, or are we going to leave the item in the portal um, and allow the user to to be able to either log a call or or try and get some sort of reasonable explanation back from the error handling. So including your inputs and output parameters is 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 important as well. Okay, so um, day two activities that I was just talking about. So so day one activity or a provisioning activity is creating an object uh, in your or an item, sorry, in your uh, VCAC portal. And a day two activity is um, being able to perform something on that that item. So let, if we go back um, to something uh, like a virtual machine, if we provision a virtual machine. Provisioning it is a day one or provisioning activity, and then powering on, powering it off afterwards is a day two activity. Same with a with a low balancer example we've used here. Um, creating a low balancer is, is a day one activity. Adding a virtual machine to it afterwards, uh, to the item we get in the VCAC portal, is a day two activity. Um, and it's very important to outline these with your customers as well. And these will all be VCO. The day two activities will also be VCO workflows that you will create in VCAC and tie to uh, an action. Um, designing day two activities in your service design is, is important because you need to, to decide whether if, uh, if, if enough, whether if some of the services you've been asked to provision, uh, create in, in VCAC can be um, provisioning activities, day one activities, or if they actually can be day two activities. So a good example is two of the services I was asked to design for, for my last customer was create a load balancer and one was one delete a load balancer. Uh, there were two services I was, I was given to create. Delete a load balancer is actually a day two activity of creating a load balancer. So in our document, we documented that the provisioning of, uh, of the load balancer is day one and deleting it is going to be day two. And that helps us with some of our previous information on our inputs because we could just use the, the outputs of the provisioning activity for the name and the unique identifier, etc. So documenting uh, services configuration, so like I was, I was saying earlier, documentation for workflows is difficult to produce at a customer level. Um, the, the design documents that we, we produce for our services, they aren't designed to, to accommodate non-technical people. They're designed for technical people who understand um, automation to be able to go away and, and create, create the workflows for us, maybe in some of our development areas. And, and then provide them to us, we tweak them a little bit and then put them in the customer environment. Um, we also write, I also write a lot of workflows myself, um, but the documentation, is, it's very difficult to produce documentation at a level um, that the customers will find um, good for them. Uh, very often they'll, they'll just sort of uh, agree with you and, and sign it off, not really knowing what you've designed. So you may, may need to sit down on your review processes for this documentation, really, really spell it out what each step's doing what, what in your um, in your uh, tables for your inputs, outputs, uh, and your integration systems, how you're integrating with them, etc., etc. And like uh, I've said before, 
often workflows being used are existing workflows from the BCAC library, so you don't really need to, to document them at a, at a code level. You can just reference those and, and maybe the version, the DCA that you're using in the version of the workflow. Um, and uh, dynamic types are something that I've included below. So, um, Frank, have we, have we, are we running close on time? Have I got time to talk about dynamic types? So far, there's no questions in. Uh, if there are any questions, uh, don't hesitate to just raise your hand or use the chat window or the questions window. But apart from that, yep, you can. I think you can go ahead. Yeah, cool. Yes, yeah, so if anyone's got any questions, well, I'm, so I'm talking about this. If they just want to submit them, um, and then we can cover them after. So, so dynamic types is, to, like we were saying earlier, is something that Christoph's been um, pushing on the, the VMware community forums quite a lot. It's a way of it, it's a way of creating yourself a plugin for uh, for something that necessarily a plugin doesn't exist for, um, and the one that everyone's been focusing on is NSX. So it allows you to create objects. Um, for example, NSX uses a REST API, so you fire off commands to it, and you don't really get much back. You'll get um, maybe a 200 response if it completes, or a 400 response with uh, some sort of information if it fails. Uh, dynamic types will allow you to create an object that will be referenceable for uh, sending these to commands to. So if you create something uh, like a, uh, a load balancer, it will give you an object in BCAC and BCO for you to be able to then issue commands against rather than having to, to specify explicitly in the REST command the information that you, that you want to do. Um, I'm sure if, if <laughs> I'm sure if Christoph or some of the other BCO guys uh, heard me explaining this, they'll be able to elaborate on it in a lot more detail. Um, it's not fully supported at the moment. Um, so it hasn't been implemented in very, very many PSO projects, um, but it should be fully supported in the next release of BCO. Uh, that should be 5.5.2, and it should also be fully supported in the next release of BCAC, um, where it will actually be integrated. And it's definitely something that, that if you're interested in, in programming and service design at this level, you should, you should really have a look at. Um, so that's me at, at an end. Do we have any questions, Frank? No, no questions, but yep. Thank you, definitely, for presenting. Excellent. It was a pleasure if, uh, again. If anyone has any uh, any questions or, or think of anything afterwards or, or wants to do it, maybe even correct me or, or tell me I've said something wrong, then um, feel free to contact me on Twitter or, or my uh, my email, which is uh, pmonk at vmware.com, or, um, yeah, or, or connect with me on LinkedIn. And otherwise, I think next week uh, you're up again. Um, this time with um, service design, IAAS, and PAS, uh, and the machine lifecycle. Uh, yeah, so I've got covered some of those subjects in this one. So I think we're going to slightly tweak the one next week. We'll, um, we'll probably look at um, advanced extensibility. I think was was the other one we were going to cover. Okay, brilliant. Then. Thank you for everyone attending, and thanks again, Phil, for presenting, and see you all next week. No problem. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Cheers. Bye. -bye. Yes, bye.